there is a whole new world we are building, right? We have the responsibility to build this world. How it's gonna look? How Let's not mess it up look. again, people. Let's get it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hi everyone, welcome. Uh, my name is Keza McDonald. I'm video games editor at The Guardian and I'm here to talk with the D&AD judges about some of the works from this year's um, selection. Um, with me I have Luisa Almgram falcon who is Group Creative Director at EA Games. Hi Luisa. We have Tiffany Rolfe, Global Chief Creative Officer at R slash GA. We've got Joey David Tiempo, Founder and Chief Creative at Octopus and Whale. And then we have Will Skugel, who is Director and Creative Strategy at Snap Inc. Brian Ma, who is Executive Creative Director at TBWA Media Arts Lab in Shanghai. Um, it's been a very interesting selection of Warring 2022, um, and I'm interested in hearing what our judges and panelists thought about each one. So I'll start with Luisa, whose um, selection is called Beyond Generations, Gaming Against Loneliness by Howard, Dylan, Mary, and Jason. Right, Mary, so, yeah. um, have you got the Xbox box near you? Yes, ah, okay. right in front of me. Just rip it open. That sounded right. Lift off. This one. No, this one. I'm looking forward to learning how to play video games with him. It's been good to talk to her. Slowly, I'm getting to know a few more things about her. She is a very unique character. We had a lot of fun. <laughs> I seem to be a hell driver. I've talked to her more in this time frame than I have ever. I enjoy his company. And I'm just happy that he wants to be with me. I mean, the reason I picked um, the Xbox um, uh, awards entry, um, Gaming Against Loneliness, is because normally gaming always get a lot of bad press, especially from parents who complain that their kids game too much um, on the console. They just spend way, way too much time there. But in this idea, they've actually used that to their advantage. This is so simple. They basically connected gaming kids with their elderly relatives and they wanted to tackle the problem of loneliness. Um, and the kind of the case study starts with that loneliness is amongst the elderly is on the rise, according to Age UK, with a million older people going over a month speaking to another person. I mean, that in itself is like absolutely horrific. Mm -hmm. um, and the campaign features two documentaries where we follow real life stories of two families who's lost touch. And the relatives get uh, an Xbox set up and the kids obviously know how to use it and together they start to game. And in the beginning, the, the conversation is really painful um, to watch. It's sort of still there, they don't know what to say, but as they keep gaming, the conversation moves on and they kind of open up more and more. Um, and in the end, you kind of have this relationship blooming between the older generation and the new generation. Um, and they kind of, they almost turn into therapy sessions in the end where the kids open up about, you know, worry about, are they going to go to uni? Are they not going to go to uni? Are they going to pass the driving test? Um, you know, all those fears and the elderly can sort of put them at ease with these things. And I think that's, that's a really lovely thing because, you know, gaming is so much more um, than just the game itself. It's also about connecting um, people together. Um, and I think that there's so many different varieties of games out there. you got FPS, you got racing, you got co-op, you've got fantasy, games that can make you laugh and cry and get your pulse racing. But more importantly, it can really, really bring people closer together. Um, and as part of their initiative, they um, sort of did a, a, a take on the unboxing theme and instead they did the reboxing thing. So they had kids give up their old consoles put beautiful little packaging on it um, with instructions where they printed with really, really sort of big type lettering on how to put it together and how to use it. And it was sent to um, elderly relatives and to nursing homes to kind of get younger people connected with older people to sort of raise this issue about loneliness. And I just thought it was a really lovely way of showing how gaming um, can bridge generations, but also bring people closer together because um, gaming is, is just 
something that's really sociable and fun. It's interesting as well, because obviously the social aspects of gaming can seem kind of invisible to the older generation who doesn't necessarily mm. play, right? Like to, to a person who doesn't necessarily understand games that well, what it looks like is a person sitting by themselves. Whereas actually, of course, most of the time, especially teenagers, when they're playing, they're with other people, right? Just not in the real world. Yeah, and I, I think that's that's the thing. It's like there's something for everything. And it's so important for, for both kids and elderly to be part of a community. And this is something that, you know, Xbox as a brand has really lifted. So I, I hope that they keep up the initiative and sort of give up more Xboxes to, to more sort of elderly nursing homes community to bring more people together. Um, to keep us on time, I better move us on to the next selection, um, which is Tiffany's selection, Long Live the Prince. I found this one particularly moving myself. Um, Tiffany, would you like to go over this entry and why, why it struck you? Kyan Prince had everything to live for, but he lost his life outside the school gates of the London Academy in Edgware. 15 years after teenager Kyan Prince was stabbed and killed outside his school in London, his potential is finally being recognised as a professional footballer, the footballer he should have been. What a goal by Kyan Prince! Goal! Listen, man, EA, this is badass. What we want to do is take people on a journey. We can help them change their mindset and lead them to success in the same route that Kyan was leading his life to success. Yeah, um, this idea is called Long Live Prince. It was about um, a young man who at the time was 15, 2006, I believe, and he was a fast rising soccer star and he was fatally stabbed um, outside of a school while he was, he was trying to prevent um, the bullying of another student and was stabbed by another, um, another young person. And so 15 years later, at the age of when he would have been 30, um, they brought him back as 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 the soccer star he would have been um but as a as a as a game player within fifa and beyond um and this is one that i think um, really resonated with our whole jury and to to the point we just started talking about this idea of ideas that maybe have parts of ideas that have existed before but iterating i think we're especially when it comes to technology when it comes to this category i think sometimes um our our desire for everything in award shows to be like absolutely brand new and things we've never seen before doesn't necessarily always apply. I think we have to get into the mindset of, of iteration and building on technologies, improving them, because there's been a lot of experimentation and you don't want to leave it there. And so, you know, while we'd seen this attempt of maybe um, almost like a gimmick of a recreation of someone through, you know, a virtual you know, bringing someone back back to life virtually, I think the, that this um, evolution of that, you know, concept really showed the power of how messages and storytelling can be conveyed in a totally different way within a gaming environment. You know, how profound it can be when you can experience a story and not just tell a story. Um, and also when you think about connecting to a new generation of, of young people where they're at, you know, how do you connect with them within the place they are in these in these gaming worlds and in a way that they understand. And I think this also um, bridged worlds. That's another, I think, theme that we saw was how do you take things beyond and outside um, a gaming platform, connecting them across many forms of storytelling in real world environments. You know, he, while he was a gaming character that you could actually play, he was sponsored by um, sports brands, he was on billboards, he was, you know, named on a stadium. And so you really see this, this bridge between the physical and the digital that I think as a theme, we'll continue to do both because our, our realities are going to be blurred. And also it's about bringing new people in and, and, um, and new ways to think about gaming. So um, this is one that I think just profound storytelling. And I think the integration and depth of the partnership, and that's another thing too, as we think about brand partnerships um, and what, if you if you partner in the right ways, how, how much more uh, meaningful they can be when they didn't just sponsor or, you know, put his number in for a period of time. They created a character, they used technology to, to recreate what his stats might've been 15 years later, you know, working with AI, you know, working with facial um, uh, generation, you know, in terms of where, who, what he would look like, the player that he would have become. And, um, and he was fully a playable, playable character. And also the messaging of the, of the um, organization 
was, was part of it where you could go deeper into that story. And then there were also um, learning environments for young people. So they could just not only see this, this person as, as the legacy, but also help shape and define their own personal stories and, and how they can um, you know, rethink the, the path that they wanna be on through, you know, through the story that, of this young person um, and how they could have lived. So that I think was a lot of what we talked about in this one. And, and I just thought that theme that you brought up, Will, around how do we continue to iterate and build upon versus just dismiss the past and have to come up with something new from scratch. I think that's a, a big thing that we'll, we'll continue to see within this category. And like the previous campaign, this one connected to a real world issue as well in that yeah. obviously Kind Prince's parents have, have been campaigning against knife violence and youth violence for, for all that, all those 15 years since, right? Yeah, and how can you replace it with that positive story? How can young people kind of see a different path? Um, how can gaming be a positive expression and, and place for, for young people to spend their time and connect with people rather than feeling like they, they have no way, no way out or no alternate path? So I think that's where, you know, can gaming, where again, we some, there's tension around it. I have young kids I'm always debating, you know, how much how much gaming versus not, how much screen time screen time versus not. And so when you actually see that there are these these positive paths and and real connection that can you know lead to to great outcomes, um, that's always a, as a a great narrative for for gaming. And also, it's a really clever way of talking to an audience that is so saturated. Like in terms of like young people do not want to listen to ad messages. So it was so clever how they integrated it in that kind of way with stats that you know players of FIFA absolutely love to really kind of deep dive into and it, it was just a really clever way of talking to young kids on their turf in a kind of language that they understand. Um, I know that there's a question that's supposed to talk about about the emerging themes for this year and this is exactly what I found as well is how the path cross between the real world and the virtual world. And I see quite a few of campaign of gaming is trying to tackle some of the real life topics like sexism, racism, like real issue in the real world, but actually tackle in the virtual world, which is, I find it very fascinating. That is really like blurring, blurring the line between real and, and the virtual world. And like, you know, the campaign like Pride, the Pride Race, you know, the gender swap, the cause of bullying, there's so many of them. I think at the end of the day, like um, what Tim Lee said earlier, human insight is is still going strong, no matter it's gaming world or, or real world, right? I mean, at the end of the day, is what hit hard to people's hearts and, and what would stay with us with the message. And those are the ones that win this year, I think. The next entry of her discussion is another one that's very much in this zone of the blending of real and virtual, um, which is vanguards of photographers. Uh, Brian, would you, like, would you like to introduce that entry and why it struck you? We've created a virtual camera. It's like a, a portal into the game engine. Not only does it transcend them into the game engine, but back in time. Do you have a 50 mil I can use? Yeah. I felt like they were situations that I would normally capture. I was impressed how kinetic the game was because everything is actually happening and moving around. This is what war looks like. This is what conflict looks like. This is it. This is real. This theme of the crossing between the, uh, um, the real world and the virtual world keep going. Um, I mean, the quality of the graphic of gaming getting better uh, and better, more realistic, more immersive. And I think advertising, I mean, advertising agency, we need to find innovative way and fresh way to promote games. And I think this campaign for regards of photographers did just that. Uh, it's feel very fresh and provoking. They cleverly uh, borrow real life subject matter to promote a gaming experience. Uh, partnering with war photo journalists to step inside the game and photo photograph the games war song like they would do in real world. I mean, to give legit legitimacy to how realistic the game graphics to the fans. I think it's such a cool concept. I know that uh, me and Will have talked about it and how much we have love for this idea. Um, it creates so much talking point, no matter it's inside the gaming community or outside. I mean, it's just a eye-opening uh, uh, executions. And I think 
at the end of the day, gamers are regular people too, you know, just don't think of gamers as like a separate species, you know, they care what we anybody cares about. And then if uh, I think um, this campaign is, um, just uh, did a fantastic job of that. It's interesting. This was one um, that also did did well on our jury, but there was a you know there were some conversations about it, and I think um, timing. You know, we're in the middle of of experiencing real war, war, so there was definitely discussion around that. But I think there's something really interesting in that the tension that is there a bit, and there's a question I think we're going to continue to ask is like what is real and what isn't real, what deserves kind of being considered real as a real experience when we start to get even more um, immersed in kind of virtual goods and our virtual lives, that's as real as anything else for many people. And so I think this is a, this sort of scratches the surface on that question when you start to blend, um, you know, what, what is a real war photographer with, with a gaming environment. And, and I think that's a really um, relevant question that we're all kind of asking right now and this starts to to scratch the surface of yeah i think it happens to our jewelry as well the, the, the debate about this campaign is mainly about them using the real war journalism to promote a war game are we glorifying war right i mean especially like at this time and i think it's like how far would you push right i mean like uh to 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 promote a game and i think it's a very interesting question in video games, um, creative itself as well, obviously the idea of the military video games have been part of the gaming landscape for pretty much as long as video games have existed, like video games and, and military themes and war themes are very, very interlinked. And I think there's a lot of interesting questions right, around what that means now and how that makes us, makes us think about the intersections between um, how war is portrayed in our media and how it's portrayed through social media and of, of course how it is in real, in real world. Um, Joey, this was uh, one of the, your favorite entries as well, right? Yes, it's my favorite piece of uh, the lot. It's my favorite work in the category that I've seen. And uh, I agree with Tiffany that there was a lot of discussion around this particular piece of work. I think we spent a lot of time discussing if this really um, is a good time, you know, to glorify this kind of work. Unfortunately, the work is Call of, Call of Duty vanguards and it is really a war game and uh truth be told i spent several days after the judging thinking about what could i have said you know to push this work a little further because i really believe that this is a fantastic piece of work and it's not easy to get um work through to gaming because gaming i think takes a lot of it's it's like several categories into one so it's um, Vanguard to Photographers, for example, is an example of experience. It's a great experience um, seeing the graphics through to how the photographers are showing it. Um, it's a storytelling piece. It's an entertainment piece. It's an outdoor piece um, based on the photos that these photographers took that are being used by the game to promote itself. And at the same time, it's a social piece because people are going to talk about several aspects of the game, whether it be the technical aspect because of the FPS and, you know, the theme of Vanguard um, and how realistic it is. So for me, to for all those moving parts to be distilled into this beautiful piece of work um, kept me awake for several days. So that's what we did. And I think what's great about this is that we were fighting for work. Um, that we really, really believed in. And we were passionate about it, um, about several pieces of the work, specifically um, this and some other um, work that we felt very passionate about, the prints, for example. Um, but this in particular, this particular work, Vanguards of Photographers, took a lot of time. <laughs> um, and we discussed it thoroughly, moved it around, um, and had discussions after, um, because this is such thought-provoking work. I feel like the next, um, the next entry here, which Will is going to introduce for us, was also extremely thought-provoking, also obviously related to war. Um, Will, would you like to talk to us about the bookcase for tolerance? What I also was always thinking about was what, what would their rooms look like? Look like this flag has a lot of meaning to me because it's just really my roots. <laughs> They don't realize that behind each one of these people, people there 
there is a story. I think it's important that uh, we all listen to each other. You know their face and their story, then it's very hard to hate them. With the book Case for Tolerance, I think that the, the main thing I, I wanted to kind of just settle on before talking about the work specifically was that this is the first year, as I understand it, that the DNAD has recognised augmented reality as a sort of subcategory in its own right. And I think that in itself is a really refreshing example of the direction we're heading in, in relation to one of the points that um, was uh, being made by Tiffany around what's our reality, what's the existing reality, right? Like augmented reality, virtual reality, mixed reality, whatever you want to call it, is a, is a new reality for a lot of us. Um, and certainly at Snapchat with AR sitting, you know, really at the heart of the platform, the way people communicate, there's just a huge behavioral shift in terms of the way people use AR, not just on our platform, but on other platforms as well. And I think that the the idea of being able to recognize and actually extrapolate some of these craft forms and give them recognition for what they are. You know, AR is clearly very different to VR. They're different disciplines, they're different experiences. When you're designing and building for augmented reality, you create for, you know, 30, 40% of the pixels uh, instead of say, you know, 100% of the screen, for example. And I think with Bookcase for Tolerance, this is just a wonderful example of how AR can be additive to the experience people choose to have. There's a wonderful kind of layer of attention that is, I guess, kind of traditionally so missing with, or, or kind of thought of as a diminishing commodity that's very present in AR, people choosing to bring a bookcase, a, an icon of, of kind of, of prejudice, right, from the past to tell a story of the present, for me is such a powerful idea. And often when we, think about kind of what's happening in the future we have to look to the past as well to kind of help tell that story so the idea that people can choose to bring a, an augmented reality bookcase that tells such a powerful historical story to deliver stories of today and be experienced absorbed spent time with on the terms of the person experience a person welcoming the experience into their space is just incredibly powerful and i think just such a good example of what the opportunity is with um augmented reality specifically so really difficult story to tell to an audience that's traditionally hard to reach i think the vehicle of using augmented reality to drive that attention to deliver that story to create an experience that people could spend minutes with over and over and over again to go and revisit just like a bookcase and using something that is such an icon of, of a world and a behavior and a time that that can actually be, you know, sadly not, I guess, kind of known as some of the younger generations coming through and to be able to retell that story to kind of remind people of some of the extreme prejudices that exist in the world today, I think is is incredibly powerful. Um, and it was it was just, you know, it was a really, really nicely executed piece as well. Lucy, you look like you have something to say about well, I, 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 I was going to say that what's, what's interesting with a lot of these ideas in terms of what we saw in the gaming category is where what you would say like normal advertising creatives start doing gaming briefs and how they sort of come at it from a really, really different angles. And I think that's where we're starting to see so many interesting new ways, because a lot of the other categories like advertising creators have, have like been working those categories for years and gaming is a fairly new category. So there's so much left to explore and you can really see how creatives really get off on, on like these new categories, these new partnerships and how they're starting to interact with um, gaming brands in a whole new way. So I think it's a good example of that. I think it's interesting though, because it is, um, while there's new ways of thinking about it, there's also caution there too. We had an amazing, um, very experienced expert gaming jury um, who played the game. So we're in there and and would also call BS on the things that, that weren't really things that would be played or had been played or were real. Um, and so I think, you know, it, it can't be just used for, hey, one off, great, cool, creative idea on paper. Like, was this actually useful to game? Did gamers engage with this? You know, and I think having that 
that real depth. You have to you have to commit to it authentically and probably more than any other category because it is one where you know you're you're inside of it, you're playing it, you're spending time with it like you you might not in others. Um, and there's definitely a, a bar you have to to hit in understanding the behaviors of those platforms and games for it to really resonate. I think that's such a such a key point. The idea of the kind of authenticity of experience. I think in gaming as well uh, versus advertising, there is a very specific role for the brand to kind of be part of the experience. In advertising, it's often the brand saying, I want more exposure. I want people to talk about the brand. But in gaming, it has to not intrude into the experience. So as we were judging, we were also looking at is a brand um, getting in the way of the game or getting in the way of me having fun? Or is it blatantly just, you know, it has to be a mix of that. Like, is it just a brand on a shirt or on a uniform or on a piece of a healing potion? Or is it a brand that's felt, as in the case of the prince, um, where um, you are able to experience the life of someone who has sort of been resurrected to live again and be a hero in his own story. So I think that is what gaming um, pushes for brands and, and, and in the case of advertising, you know, push it in, pushes it in new categories that are previously, you know, unexplored, which is why it's super, super exciting. We did have quite a, a really interesting and kind of almost a dominating debate early on in our jury about the idea of integrated and what does that really mean today? Because I think, you know, uh, Prince is actually, a, I think, a wonderful example of this, where the kind of the idea and the core experience and the audience kind of penetration really happened in the game. And, and that's where that wonderful story was brought to life. But then, you know, the idea that the uh, the the image of Prince was also used in out of home, out, home, out of home or, you know, possibly, you know, within other areas as well how how many places do you need to exist for a campaign to be integrated you know can you be integrated uh if you don't have tv and out of home for example i would argue that you you can absolutely but i think that certainly as we start to think about kind of what does that actually mean it was a discussion that, that really um really interesting discussion that, that kind of took up a big part at the beginning of our jury I think something that seems to be coming up over and over in this discussion is the the kind of idea of um, video games making the impossible possible, whether that's um, time travel, it's you know putting war photographers into wars from the last century, whether it's you know seeing the world when you can't, when you're in some way physically constrained, when you're seeing people who are far away from you, or or in the case of um, Prince, seeing people who are no longer with us. Um, but then also there's there's this uh, there's this theme of video games being a way to highlight issues that exist in the real world, which is of course the subject of gender swap. The next entry, um, Joy, would you like to introduce gender swap for us? First off, I think I'm going to talk about uh, how I viewed this uh, particular piece of work. When I joined the gaming category, I was super excited because I think I spent more time playing video games than I did in advertising. So I went into this feeling, you know, very, very engaged. And I really wanted to, like, put myself into this. Um, and so as a woman gamer, this particular piece resonated with me a lot. Gender Swap is about uh, highlighting the use of over-sexualized uh, rep representation of women in games. And I think as someone who have played games for a long, long time, um, I have, it has become normal for me to see women fighters wearing very skimpy clothing or um, being a witch getting in the way of a hero trying to save the world. So this is a real issue that we're facing in gaming and women in games in this particular piece um, attributed it to the lack of women in the gaming industry. Um, and so 
they were trying to put forth this issue of how do we solve this problem? How do we solve the issue of hypersexualized women and have more women in the gaming industry so that women can be represented properly and portrayed accurately? You know, not everybody moves in the way women move in games, right? They move a certain way. They fight Nobody certain... moves like women move in fighting games. No yeah, it's like, who moves like that? Who, I mean, no one. <laughs> Um, yourself, only Joey. Reason... That's me all day. No, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna start watching you from here on. Um, I think only recently have uh, women been portrayed um, accurately in games, as in the case of, say, Forbidden West um, mm. or Last of Us. So uh, this is a real issue, and sometimes uh, for gamers and for young ones. Uh, Specifically, this has become the norm. And there are several subcultures in gaming where uh, people are affected by these representations, as in the case of cosplaying. So when you see someone dressed as, uh, say, for example, Chun-Li, and you're like, oh, why, why is a young girl dressed like that um, in a convention, right? So it's really, really important for um, this particular piece of work to introduce this issue in a gaming way. There are many ways of tackling this issue. I mean, we can talk about it in a very serious manner, but what Gender Swap did is present it in a engaging, entertaining way that mirrors how uh, the the mood and tone in gaming, which is funny. The first time I saw it, I I, I laughed, and then after which you kind of pull back and, hey, you know what? That that's a serious issue. And I think that is what most gamers felt when they saw this. Um, the use of mods also is something that was quite prevalent in the work that we've seen this year. But I think the way these mods were used to push a social issue was something um, that is different um, only because it was quite educational. It was a very fun, entertaining way to educate people about <clears throat> Uh, about gender. So um, I think this is one of those um, pieces that we kind of moved around in the jury because it was entered in several. But we felt it did very, very well in educational only because it was not super out there saying like, um, it was a very different way of presenting this serious issue in a lighthearted way, in an engaging way where people started talking about it. Um, also not intrusive in the gaming experience, but still made a dent, you know, um, as I guess they asked influencers on Twitch to talk about this topic and uh, bring it forward to their um, communities and followers. So it was, again, as in gaming, it has to be part of the experience and fit for, for purpose. So in, in educational, um, in the educational subcategory, um, I think it was able to make a serious point. I also think it was interesting in that it, um, while we looked at it through the lens of a woman, you can also look at it and say, you know, well, what if you are a man and you're expected to, you know, be this macho, muscular character as well? I mean, the idea of how binary characters are in games. And, and so you can look at that through lens of like all representation, right? And I think that's what's really interesting too, as we as we delve more into these experiences and build more, how are we not creating a world that doesn't mirror or represent the world we want it to be? And the only way you do that is if you bring in people to help build it, you know, from, from different backgrounds, different races, different genders. Um, and so while it focused on, on gender and female gender representation, it was a a, a reminder as to what how we need to be thinking about this and the responsibility we have as builders, as creators, um, as as bringing and hiring and bringing people in to really think about that in in a more you know non-binary way. Yeah, I think it's very interesting that like when the virtual world becoming more real, the issue that happens in the virtual world becomes more serious. And we have to take it seriously, like what you just talked about. Like, no matter is women or like men that who has to look like he man, you know, like 
who who looks like that, right? I mean, like, I mean, I I mean, I think that's is such a good point that um, uh, is is such a big thing as well. How we, how there is a whole new world we are building, right? We have the responsibility to build this world. How it's gonna look. How Let's not mess gonna... it up again, people. Let's get it right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it feels like so heavy now, but I think it's such a good point. It's such a big topic. I think, yeah, it's very fascinating. It is a huge topic, and I, I think that there is that, and like you say, the sort of transference and emergence and kind of connection that's coming between the sort of the old, older sort of fantastical world of of gaming imagination through to kind of real world experience and actually the connectivity of those digital layers on onto the real world as well actually i think kind of demands almost a a, a, a development of skill set and craft and thinking around how brands turn up in those spaces you know moving from that idea of you know the traditional set of brand guidelines that give you your kind of like where you put the chess pieces type of thing to how do I actually turn up in someone's world and what are my values and what's my contribution to that moment that makes me have a have a have a role to play in in in, in that space that's that's not one driven by kind of preconceived prejudice and, and things like that and I actually think that's a really really rich and and valuable space for for the creative industries and specifically in the work we do with brands to be um, working towards. And I guess just like advertising has got responsibility in terms of how we depict people in, in ads, like gaming equally has a responsibility there because I guess they raised a really important point of like the way that they do, how they do depict, especially women, because that's what the case study is about, has become the norm. We don't question it anymore because that's how we're used to seeing them. And I think that's a really important question. And I think that's what gaming brands in general need to look at is this really right or is there another way forward like it almost seems a bit old-fashioned when you look at it when they kind of raised the point it almost seems like this is where advertising was in the 50s yes yeah, the idea of being able to essentially create a new world here right so why would we replicate all of the problems with the ones that we already have why, why, why wouldn't a better one be be within sight right well, thank you everyone very much for your time and for the discussion, which I found really, really interesting um, to listen to. Um, and yeah, I think there's been some really outstanding stuff in your categories. It's been really interesting to hear you thinking on it. Thank you for hosting us, Keza. No thank you so much. Thank you so much. This is fun.